great. We missed all my good stuff at the start, but that's fine. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll go to Minister Lily D'Ambrosio. She's the Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change, as well as the Minister for Solar Homes. She's been in Parliament since 2002 in the seat of Mill Park. She's been a union organiser with a mighty ASU and is a firm friend of Trades Hall and, and many others. So welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so kindly, uh, Luke. And uh, and I want to uh, give my acknowledgements to the Wurundjeri people. Uh, and uh, they are the owners of the land on which I'm situated at the moment. And my respects are to all of them, uh, of the past, present and future, and all of those, of course, who uh, on whose lands uh, we are uh, having this meeting. And uh, I do want to thank you, Luke, uh, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, you doing this on behalf of the Trades for Council and, of course, Pat, of course, Pat Simons, Friends of the Earth campaigner. And uh, I know that um, the, your, your two organisations have been very actively engaged now for a number of years on getting uh, offshore uh, uh, wind energy uh, a reality in our state. And I really do want to thank you for your, uh, your, your stamina on this and your doggedness, uh, and it's it's uh, certainly paying off. Uh, and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be here tonight because we really can't go past the fact that um, this is the biggest renewable energy announcement in the state's history. And it's, I would say, it's also the biggest announcement in energy policy since at least the 1970s. Uh, and uh, that that is a big statement, I know, but I actually genuinely believe it. Uh, and it's about what the future can look like, will look like under our government. Uh, but it also touches so many other related matters and concerns for all of us about uh, how do we ensure that the opportunities uh, and the real outcomes uh, are shared uh, in, in, in real uh, vibrant ways uh, with a, a broad section of the community and especially those who we know uh, will be, uh, I suppose, uh, are working within an industry now that is is, is uh, changing uh, very significantly, uh, very rapidly. Now, you'll all know, of course, that uh, last Friday, uh, uh, together with the Premier, we announced that we'll be uh, bringing online at least two gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2032, with the first power by 2028. And to build a strong pipeline of projects, we've set a target of four gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2035 and nine gigawatts target by 2040. Now, people will uh, know that uh, when we set our targets in renewable energy, we, we meet them plus we actually exceed them and this will be no different. This builds on the incredible progress uh, that we've made over the past eight years, seven years, which so many of you have been a part of. And we've seen the state smash our 2020 VRED goal. You'll remember that we set ourselves a target in legislation of 25% of our renewable energy by uh, coming from, sorry, being produced uh, by 2020. Uh, and in Victoria, uh, we've more than exceeded that. Uh, renewable energy generation in Victoria uh, jumped uh, by 3.8 terawatt hours in 2021. So we exceeded our 25% target in 2020 and it jumped again uh, to, to that uh, output. Now that output in 2021 is the largest annual increase by any Australian state ever, ever. So you let that sink in. Um, and when you think about it also in the jobs uh, stakes, um, we've created more jobs in renewables than any other state in the country and we've reduced our emissions by more than any other state in the country since we've been elected. So our offshore wind targets will continue to build on what I believe is a very impressive record and one that we can be proud of. Now our coastal regions are amongst the best in the world for offshore wind uh, and when I say coastal regions I mean you know there's uh, lots of fantastic spots off the Gippsland coast, uh, Bass, uh, and also off Portland and, and even further uh, west. And uh, we have, in fact, off the shore of, of uh, the Victorian coastline, the best wind energy resource in the country and amongst the top 
uh, in the world. Uh, and we've got, uh, and just to describe what that could mean, uh, we've got uh, the potential to support uh, an enormous 13 gigawatts of capacity by 2050 just offshore, which will produce five times the current renewable energy generation in our state. We've got a combination of high wind speeds. We've got shallow waters, and that's terrific when you're looking at uh, deploying infrastructure on the ocean bed. Uh, we've got ports and transmission access, very strong, along with a highly skilled workforce. And we need to take advantage of this resource because we know that in the years to come, there'll only be more need to access electricity, uh, be it to heat our homes with increased electrification, powering our cars, or indeed making green hydrogen, renewable hydrogen. We also know that offshore wind is the best way to create thousands and thousands of new jobs, good jobs that will last for decades, thousands of jobs that will last for decades, delivering stability and the opportunity to make an incredible difference to the state's future. And thanks to the certainty that our announcement uh, will bring uh, through these targets, we'll be building a new supply chain that will service Victoria and across the whole region. That means more work for existing businesses, like, for example, Wilson's Transformers, that has been around for decades, making massive transformers for our state and interstate, and new opportunities to bring new energy manufacturing to Victoria. And finally, the announcement will play a pivotal role, a vital role in helping tackle climate change. And from here, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. We'll be starting a rigorous consultation process with local communities, with unions and the industry to get this right. We'll also be working with traditional owners from, from the very start uh, of developing the state's offshore wind resource. What we want to achieve with them is develop up a new model of engagement uh, with renewable energy projects based on principles that align with traditional owner aspirations, not only for self-determination, but economic independence. Uh, and of course, we'll push the Commonwealth to accelerate the development of federal regulatory regimes that we desperately need. Uh, we will be also releasing an implementation uh, plan uh, later in this year, uh, which will give uh, greater uh, detail about how we will plot uh, the course to a procurement process. Uh, and then of course, the developing up of uh, all of these important uh, network of supply chains and, and infrastructure upgrades that are needed to get this pro these projects going. So uh, we are going to be the home of offshore wind. We'll be the home for the country uh, and there'll be fantastic export opportunities in terms of skills too uh, for this. So, But I'll leave it at that. Uh, and thank you very much for allowing me to give a, a quick introduction to the, the, the main policy um, framework, if you like, of this policy. Thank you. I reckon that was a very thorough uh, explanation of, of, of what, what the paper and the plan is. Um, we're really excited from, from Trades Hall's perspective. Like, this is 2,000 jobs just to construct the thing, um, let alone what extra jobs will be in the manufacturing, at least 200 ongoing jobs. We haven't even started talking about green hydrogen, but I'll, I'll let someone do that in the questions maybe a little bit later. But what it's taken, and there's probably a PhD in this, Minister, um, <laughs> that it's taken state leadership again to get something done over federal inaction. Like yeah. they are completely absent in, in this space at a time in which we desperately need them to be stepping up because the planet can't wait, our jobs can't wait. Um, anyway, we're pretty pumped about this because the size of this project is, is huge as well. I, this will be the largest offshore wind farm in the world and certainly the largest project in, in the Southern Hemisphere. So I like, Announcements don't usually get this big, but it is pretty yeah. pretty massive. Yeah. All right. Well, Pat, we might bring you in to say a few words. Um, Pat introduced himself a little bit earlier, but he's from the Friends of the Earth. Um, he's a campaigner at heart. He knows the energy the energy landscape like just about nobody else. Um, I'm pretty excited he's here with us. So, Pat, do you want to say a few things? Thanks, Luke, and good day to um, Lily as well. It's good to see you here really i'm um, happy to host you tonight along with trades hall um and yeah so 
for those who don't know me, my name is Pat Simons. I'm the Yes to Renewables Coordinator at Friends of the Earth. And for the last few years, offshore wind has been a critical part of our campaigns. And I'm really happy that we've been working alongside the union movement, you know, the Maritime Union, um, ETU, Trades Hall and others um, to really um, get this industry going in Australia because it is critical for action on climate change and it is critical for job creation in regional areas like Gippsland. So, um, yeah, I just want to pick up your point, Luke, around the federal inaction. You know, I think it was, it was probably about five years, six years ago now when, you know, we sort of first heard about Star of the South and that was the opportunity for the federal government to step up and introduce laws to establish this industry. And it's taken several years of campaigning by unions and climate groups just to get them to introduce the, just the first basic regulations. And we've achieved that together and that's awesome. And now Victoria is stepping up, you know, taking it to a, a whole new level, setting ambitious targets. And if it was up to the federal government, it wouldn't be happening. So it's, it's just amazing that Victoria is, is really leading um, and, and really kind of up there with the US and the UK in terms of the ambition of, of rolling out and developing this industry. Um, in, in 2021, we commissioned some modeling from uh, the University of Melbourne, and that found that the Star of the South project alone will be critical to meeting Victoria's existing climate change targets uh, and will create hundreds of jobs uh, ongoing and thousands during the, the construction phase. And even more if we you know, develop the local supply chain and create manufacturing opportunities here. Um, so that's just one project alone. And these targets will see multiple projects um, built around the state. So that's just incredible in terms of action on climate change, because this is in addition to what's already happening you know, with the onshore renewable energy, whether that's, you know, solar on people's homes or large scale wind and solar. So as, as an action on climate change, it is a total game changer. Um, I'm also, I also wanna acknowledge what this means to communities like the Latrobe Valley. And I'm very lucky to be working alongside my, my comrade, Wendy Farmer, who's from the Latrobe Valley. And that's been an important part of this story as well, because, a lot of people in the community there, you know, they see this as the shining light. These are new power stations, new industry, it's action on climate change, but it's giving people hope and, you know, seeing the careers of the future before them. So I think that that's going to be a really important part of how, you know, this policy is rolled out in reality. So just want to um, say congrats to the minister for great work and yeah, really excited to see what we can do to, yeah, make, make the most of it and yeah. Terrific. All right. Thank you, Pat. Um, now we've actually got a fair bit of time for questions. So I'm going to ask people to pop the questions in the questions or answers. If that's a bit difficult, you can pop it into the chat and we'll pick it up. Um, the first question I want to kick off in is, is really, um, what does this, Minister, what does this practically look like for Victoria? It's going to revolutionise uh, our economy. Let, let's be clear. We, you know, we, we have to decarbonise our economy. And when I say economy, we know it's about jobs, we know it's about investment, uh, it's about making the right choices of the types of investment uh, and manufacturing, uh, the way we live our lives. This is a revolution, really. Uh, you know, this is going to take us to a new level in terms of being absolutely ready, more than ready for the transition. So when people ask themselves, you know, with um, the remaining fossil fuel power stations, what happens when they go? Um, offshore wind, you know, yep. massive gigawatts of uh, new power, new capacity available, sustaining fantastic maintenance jobs year round, year round. And the thing is, the jobs aren't just going to start in 2028 or at the point of actually, you know, installing towers. There's the lead up years. You know, from the time that you uh, have the procurement and you and the projects are chosen, and and, and to, to the development of the supply chain, getting people skilled up, uh, you're talking about you know um, the second half of the twenties, uh, and you will start to see, and communities will start to see the benefits coming much sooner 
uh, than the actual exits of the remaining coal stations, for example. Uh, and that's the beauty of this, you know, it's, it's really, really special. And um, the fact is the economies of scale with these large projects and massive turbines and towers means that the, the economic feasibility of importing a lot of the materials just won't stack up. Now, there will be probably some materials that still need to come in from overseas, but a lot of the stuff will need to be uh, manufactured or assembled here. And so you can start to understand, and these are neat maintenance too, and you can start to understand and appreciate uh, that this isn't just about gigawatts. I mean, when I started as an energy minister and started on the journey of thinking through how, how do we get uh, renewable energy projects into Victoria, my motivation wasn't just the end, the end product, the, the megawatts or the gigawatts. It was about how do we optimise the jobs through the supply chain and the skilling. Uh, impact and that's why we, we've got a really strong local supply uh, local jobs uh, policy in this state which goes through a lot of projects but also including energy and and before that actually came to energy in it, in the policy itself I ensured that um, our uh, our, uh, our processes for um, uh, tenders and the like uh, uh, required a a commitment to local content, local supply chain build-up. Terrific. Um, well, I think that leads into a good question from a local Luke Brown out there who's asking, and g'day, Luke, um, how many wind turbines do you think may be installed? That's probably a hard question. But like, how far off the coast will the turbines be? Like, What will it feel like out there in, in the ocean? Yeah, no, look, thank you. Uh, look, you will know, and thank you, Luke, uh, you will know that... Um, the government uh, has financially supported uh, to the tune of about $40 million three proponents. One of them is Star of the South, the other ones are uh, Macquarie, and then we've got Flotation. Uh, and they, um, uh, so there's opportunities for all of them to, to bid in here. Now, the chances are uh, these projects um, are more likely than not, uh, and we know definitely uh, with, some, with these three, uh, their intentions are to uh, establish them in Commonwealth waters. So you're talking about far off uh, the actual coastline of Victoria. Now, uh, how many, uh, the size of them, uh, the visibility of them, that, that these are all things that it, it's just too early to know that. Um, we know that with the economies of scale, uh, there'll be technological advancements that will, will come during this period of the planning. I mean, England, Britain itself, uh, is actually now has got a fantastic uh, number of uh, gigawatts that are, are now producing offshore power uh, through wind turbines. They're looking at doubling that, I think, by 2030, I think, if I've got that right. So, so you'll start to see the economies of scale uh, come through technological advancement. So a bit too early for us to really be able to say this is what it's going to look like. These are how many uh, turbines, these are how many, um, how many uh, wind towers that will be built. I think that's a very good answer. Now, this question has come from a couple of people. So Penny and Rowan have a, have a similar, uh, similar idea about asking about what's the cooperation that has to happen with the Commonwealth? What does the Commonwealth have to declare? Like, what's the next steps they need to step up to? And how's that going for coordination? So I think we might go to the Minister first. And then, Pat, you had some thoughts about this too. Yeah, no, thank you. We've got to remember that uh, because Commonwealth waters that's where, uh, you know, um, uh, these proposals for projects are, like, are, are wanting to go. The Commonwealth has to be made to just step up uh, and uh, provide the necessary permissions later this year. They are needed to be, for these proponents to go to the next stage. And we know that they've been playing a really deadly game um, for a number of years, a go slow uh, on, uh, on actually getting legislation through. I mean, this goes back to Josh Frydenberg's day. I know that he sat on legislation in his office, okay? He sat on it, right? So um, we just got to throw everything at it. Uh, and every day that goes by where they fail to step up to this is a day longer when uh, we don't get the jobs. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the federal government definitely needs to step up on this issue and... What, what we're looking for is, you know, the projects that are the most advanced and have the, the community support are the projects in Gippsland. 
So what the federal government really needs to do is get on with um, establishing a, an offshore wind zone for Gippsland. And that's going to enable all the planning and stuff to, to actually just get started sooner uh, rather than later because it's already been a long wait. Yeah. yeah. Um, next question I've got is, is really about um, manufacturing. Um, uh, Nick's asked a question about wind turbines that, you know, in the past sometimes have been imported and, you know, sometimes we've seen some of this product come out of Portland at Keppel Prince. Um, there's other questions from Luke, from another Luke. There's a lot of good Lukes on here today uh, about, you know, he's in Bendigo. He's the Trades Labor Council Secretary there. And he's asking, like, what are the opportunities for manufacturing in Victoria and making sure that much of it can drive more jobs and great union jobs and, you know, lift us all up? Um, I might go to you, Lily, and then Pat. Absolutely. Thank you. And it's a great question. I mean, this is a game changer. Uh, this is going to be a jobs bonanza, a manufacturing bonanza for our state. And we're ready. We want it. We want it here. Uh, and we're telling everyone who want, to, who want to hear it, other investors, come in with your projects, with your plans. Uh, we don't want just three proposals here. You know, we want, we want the pipeline. We want people to know that this is going to be the hub of the skills, of the manufacturing, of the technology. Uh, and uh, it'll be here, uh, the heart of the country, energy the new energy generation. So this will be a jobs bonanza, believe me. And, 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 it's, and, it's, and it's just right for Victoria because we were like the manufacturing state. We really were. And when the car industry left, um, that was a bit of a kick, kick in the guts for us all. And the feds, yeah. you know, ushered, ushered the car industry out. Um, this is the new type of industry. So mm. we're excited about this. Pat? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, with the current onshore industry, we have manufacturing in renewables. We have wind towers that are being, you know, manufactured in Portland. But those, you know, those are not necessarily big enough for the offshore wind projects. So we're going to see bigger components. So, you know, the plan really, the, the state really needs a plan to make the most of those manufacturing opportunities and bringing those, those new um, manufacturing industries in order to actually build these projects in reality. Now, Richard has a question about um, energy transmission infrastructure to support both onshore and offshore. Yeah. Um, do you want to give a bit of an update about how that's going in Victoria? Yeah, thank you. And look, you know, you know, how, how, how terrific is it that uh, exactly uh, where we've got uh, the mass, existing massive uh, electricity infrastructure uh, you know, off Portland, uh, off, off Gippsland is also where the best wind resource is. Look, we, we, we are because we've been, we, we have been uh, a net exporter of electricity now for, for decades and decades. Uh, and we remain a net exporter of power. And so we've built over many decades really strong uh, uh, transmission infrastructure. Uh, and it's going to be carrying different types of power now. It's going to be clean power. So it's going to actually make it uh, easier to have these projects built because we've got the existing uh, transmission network and big infrastructure available to them. Uh, and, of course, there needs to be the connections between where the, the project itself is located offshore and having that connected up to, to the big uh, infrastructure. There will still need to be some... Uh, transmission uh, infrastructure built to, to, to have, fill the gap, if you like, between uh, offshore and uh, and where the, the big infrastructure exists now. Uh, but we are very lucky to have that and it will be put to very good use. Do you have anything to add? Uh, no, nothing on that point, no. All right, well, let's go to a different point then. Um, Simon Cohen asks, uh, who will own the projects and will Victorians been able to invest in them? It's very easy to invest in fossil fuels through large ASX listed companies. It'd be yeah. great to have local renewable projects for us to invest in. Good question. Yeah, it is a good question. But look, uh, you know, a lot of that de depends on uh, the proposals that come forward, who the proponents are. And there'll be, you know, some very uh, careful, considered thinking around, well, what is the model that we need for the procurement process? You know, what does the model look like? Uh, but let, let's be really clear that these are going to be massive projects uh, and you're going to need and we will be needing a lot of uh, non-government investment in them, absolutely. But we know these won't get built unless uh, state governments back them. 
through a variety of means, okay? Now, I can't go into the detail of what those means might look like, um, but some of you will be familiar, well, you will be familiar with some of the means that we've used in the past. And, you know, we've got the VRET1, we've got a model there, VRET2 is underway now. Uh, so we, that, that's the, the lot of the work uh, that we have to develop up. Uh, and we'll be able to, we'll be in a better position to be able to explain that a little bit better uh, in the implementation plan uh, later in this year. Uh, Pat, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that, you know, this is a, an area that's really interesting and engages people a lot. People really care about ownership and who owns energy. Something that yeah. we've seen in Europe is that some of the, both, both for onshore and offshore, is that um, requirements for certain levels of community ownership are uh, in the project. So there, there is a lot of potential here just at the start of the industry to, um, you know, start off with the best possible situation and, and, you know, encourage greater community ownership in across the whole industry. So I think that's something that, you know, it would be great to see more of. Sure. Yeah, and when it comes to community ownership, um, there's a question from Pat, um, and his question is, well, what does this mean for working with First Nations people? Well, uh, I uh, personally <clears throat> ensured that uh, there was a really clear statement referencing uh, the uh, directions paper that uh, was issued last Friday uh, about our intent, <clears throat> and that is to develop up together with traditional owners, um, you know, uh, a, a, I suppose a new approach uh, to how uh, they could potentially um, uh meet have their aspirations for self-determination and economic independence met through big projects such as these now what that exactly looks like i'm not going to uh, preempt or, or pretend to know because ultimately uh, we want to make sure that traditional owners are able to you know, put their views forward and and we'll work that through as we go but um, my hope uh, is that uh, to use uh, this game-changing uh, policy uh, to present really terrific opportunities for traditional owners. Uh, and, uh, and you know, uh, we're, we're on that journey to treaty. What does it look like? It's going to look, yeah. you know, it's going to have, it's going to take many shapes and forms. Um, and, uh, and this is something that for me is very personal, not personal in, in sense of um, uh, other, other than, you know, a, a personal commitment to, uh, to um, assisting where I can uh, the traditional owner aspirations. Terrific. Um, there's a question that like lots of uh, punters out there will have, and Pat, I might start with you. What, what what is the impact of these type of projects on on the hip pocket on paying for electricity bills? Well, I think you know at this point it's very early in the days to look at the you know the price impact. But um, you know, when it comes to renewable energy, it's in general it's the cheapest form of generation, and that's because there's no fuel source. So offshore wind, it, it is it is a bit more expensive than onshore wind because it's a whole new sector. But what's critical is that uh, this is um, you know this is really reliable power supply. The International Energy Agency calls it baseload renewables, and so um, you know. It's more about the value that it provides for the system. So as we go to renewables, we need to make sure that, you know, we're able to produce electricity all of the time so that people can, you know, go about their lives and actually, you know, access basic services and so on. Um, so this, this, we see this as being you know, really critical for the energy reliability, but it's also action on climate change. So it's hard to give you a direct answer on the price impact, but yeah, we'll see over time. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, look, uh, we know that, and I was asked this question today uh, uh, in an interview, yeah. a long interview, and um, the reality is uh, when, when, when a new technology is first deployed, uh, it will have a particular cost profile because it's the first. Uh, first movers tend to have, you know, um, sort of a, a built-in uh, uh, cost, if you like. Uh, but then very quickly we know price starts coming down uh, when... Uh, uh, new projects come online uh, and we saw that happening with renewable energy to the point where a few years ago uh, we could all say that it is and it still remains the case it is the cheapest form of new build energy that you can produce and it yeah. remains the case and people's prices 
people's bills in Victoria in the last five years, they, they've been the lowest in five years, bills, actual money they've had to pay on their, their electricity bills. Uh, and, um, and that's because of renewable energy coming on board. Now, so uh, the cost profile of offshore will be larger, it will be different, of course, because we will be the first there. But our aim is uh, when you go big, uh, you start to get, uh, you know, an impact uh, that will be beneficial in terms of prices. So, uh, and planning ahead enables you to ensure that you get the best pricing uh, available. Uh, and uh, and as, uh, as offshore wind in other countries uh, starts being uh, deployed even further and expanded, you, you know, improved technologies, we'll get the benefit of those. So we'll start to see those coming into our new projects. I, th I think that's right. Like we've given a signal to the market now that we are not building one project. We're building a whole pipeline of projects. So that's companies right. are going to look at this and go, oh, why wouldn't we invest in Victoria? Why wouldn't we look to improve their energy in the same time as our air? Um, and it will rapidly bring down prices over time. Absolutely. It's, I, th I think this is a project we're going to be pretty proud of. Um, I got an interesting question from Rosalind and someone else asked a similar question too uh, about uh, what would be the environmental impact of, of putting offshore wind in? I know they're doing some studies now. I, I actually saw a video, everybody, of um, they, they sort of put these videos underwater to, to track the marine life. And if you look closely, in one of them, you can see a shark eat an octopus. <laughs> it's a bit full on. But anyway, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Lou. And uh, look, yeah, environmental impacts, uh, environmental assessments are really critical uh, to be understood uh, so that, um, you know, we, we produce the best projects uh, in terms of environmental standards. Uh, and I, I, I'm the Environment Minister and really proud of it. So we're always going to have, and I will always have an eye to ensuring that uh, the, uh, the environmental, um, uh, uh, the, the environment is considered very carefully uh, and in, in the development of, uh, of these projects. Uh, the same as we do with the renewable energy projects on shore, uh, that's, uh, this will be no less uh, important, absolutely. And uh, there will be a lot of um, uh, conditions um, and standards that need to be met, demonstrated to be met by, by, by proponents. There's also the spiritual and cultural <clears throat> considerations also for traditional owners, because we know that when they, when traditional owners talk about country, they don't just talk about land, they talk about the sea uh, and, and the spirituality. And I know that that's, um, that's something that uh, needs to uh, be considered because there will be some special places um, offshore uh, that, that have a, a, a strong significance spiritually, at least with some of the traditional owners uh, in particular parts of the state. Great. Uh, Simon, I might start with you for the next question. Uh, we have a few people ask about green hydrogen. So like, what is it? How would this interact? How will this help industries? Um, yep. We should talk about this for a bit. Pat? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Before, do you mind if I go, just, just on the environment impacts, I just want to reiterate the Minister's comments about, yeah, the spiritual um, value of, you know, sea country and what First Nations people are looking for. And that's what we're, we're hearing from people. And that's really, really important. And the planning, the planning um, and funding those environmental studies is really key because this, you know, it's, we need to understand the marine environment properly to plan the projects properly. So that's, that's going to be key. Uh, moving to green hydrogen, um, uh, you know, offshore wind has, you know, a lot of capabilities to produce excess energy so that additional electricity supply uh, can be used for powering industries like renewable hydrogen. So, you know, we'd like to see it be coming from renewable energy sources, not from f fossil fuel sources, so that it is genuinely zero emissions. So offshore wind could be a game changer for that, that industry. Sorry, mm -hmm. Minister, over to you. No, thank you, Pat. Thank you. And and uh, I suppose with, with hydrogen, and yes, absolutely. And uh, for me, uh, you know, green hydrogen and renewable hydrogen uh, is becoming much more uh, cost competitive uh, with alternative forms of hydrogen. And it also comes zero emissions from, from the very beginning. So um, that's going to be a massive game changer. So renewable hydrogen will play a really vital role uh, uh, in, in parts of industry that 
electrification won't necessarily be the answer to, to decarbonising uh, their energy needs. Uh, it will also be really critical for um, uh, transportation, especially heavy transportation um, and, uh, and, and even aerospace uh, technologies. So uh, this is really important to understand that our journey to decarbonisation uh, we know what the answers are for the electricity system uh, and what the solutions are, and that's what we're doing. And obviously we're adding to that with this and with this uh, announcement here, these targets. But the rest of the, the fossil fuels, such as oil and gas, uh, need a solution. And green hydrogen can be one of those solutions, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, now, I've got a great question from Cam Walker. Um, g'day, Cam. We know you very well. Um, I wonder if the minister, and I'm sure the minister does, have an opinion on the recent announcement by the Victorian Liberal opposition they will commit to now acting on climate change. Uh, he goes on to say, last time they were in power, they gutted climate commitments. Is this a positive sign for climate becoming an issue at the state election? You've got a lot of thoughts about this. I've got a lot of feelings about it, but I've got a lot start, of I've got a lot of things in the last 48 hours. But listen, make no mistake, please, any of you, as much as we'd like to think and hope that there's genuine bipartisanship and there needs to be on climate change. What happened this week is nowhere near that. And, and, and I say that with every due caution because we've been down this road before. Victorians have been down this road before. What they've said is not a commitment. What they've said the other day, Matthew Guy yesterday, uh, was only a reaction to having been embarrassed and exposed for having uh, no policy on climate change and for having uh, had uh, a shadow minister who went out with no permission and no cover for what he said. And let's remember what it was that he said. Um, he said very little. You know, he talked about, oh, you know, it'd be good to have commitment to net zero by 2050. Yeah, really? Is it, are you committed to it? Um, and nothing to say about 2030. That was not a commitment. Uh, and he was tested on it and he couldn't have anything. He didn't have anything to say. Then David Davis, the morning after, gets on the radio and says, lies, says we voted for or waved through all of the, you know, we've had the, we've supported this for a long time. We've waved through or supported the government's legislation on climate change and renewable energy. Well, that is an absolute lie. Now, we, we searched Hansard. Don't believe me, believe Hansard. It's an independent record of parliament. And they divided on a number of bills. They divided on the climate change legislation and voted against it. Right? They divided on uh, the VRET uh, uh, increase in VRET to 50% target. That was after 2018. Right? That was just two years ago. They voted against it. David Davis voted against it. So, and what Matthew Guy did yesterday afternoon was only as a result of having been embarrassed and, uh, and exposed for being a fraud. Uh, these people have come even after Scott Morrison. Even Scott Morrison came in earlier than them. So let's not believe it because what Matthew Guy actually said in his press conference yesterday afternoon were um, words that you could not necessarily pin him down to on, Okay. So please, uh, I would say to you, uh, don't, don't tick that one off your list because it doesn't exist. There is no policy. There is no policy document anywhere. Uh, and uh, and uh, it was a way of just putting the cover on uh, a, an embarrassing couple of days that they had uh, where they still don't have a policy and they don't have one. Yeah, look, I couldn't agree any harder. Like... Um... <laughs> To think that the Liberal Party at this point, this far out election, is suddenly saying they care about climate change after so many years of disregarding the science and with, like, that group of MPs who are pretty much on the far conservative side of politics, for, them, for us to actually think that they truly believe that this is something they need to do for the planet is... I, I just find it stunning that anyone would be conned by that. Pat, yeah. you've engaged with all political parties about... What's your quick thoughts on this? Well, you know, where we welcomed the recent announcement by the opposition with cautious optimism, but we're more than well aware of their track record. And even with their recent commitments, they are light years behind on this issue because 
they have had a history of being antagonistic on action on climate change and you know opposing all of the important policies that the minister just outlined uh so yeah we're more than well aware that they've got a lot to do to catch up and we'll be pressing them very hard on this issue up towards the election do you, do you mind if i just add sorry to just just last friday when the premier got up and made this announcement they attacked it they attacked our offshore wind energy targets not even five, not even seven days ago. So, you know. Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite shocking. Like something that that's actually an industry that would deliver jobs and find another solution. And they just go out and just, just can it because it's not theirs. Um, anyway, and, and enough about them. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, it's, it's easy to go after them a little bit. Um, we've got one last question. Uh, we've had a few people write in like when will the job start and like we need a skilled workforce for this and there's a lot of people that Carolyn points out they're already in like doing big infrastructure jobs in Victoria right now um so what do we think is the time frame no thank you uh well this is where uh, a lot of intense work will happen between now and when we release our implementation plan but then there's still more work after that and and it's about ultimately what are the plans that proponents come to government with when when there's a formal commercial procurement process, let's say, um, uh, then we will need to certainly be ready for an understanding of, okay, what, what, what's the, what are the skills that are needed? Uh, when, by when does that skilled workforce need to be ready to, to stand up? Uh, what role do TAFEs play in it potentially? You know, do, uh, do universities need to churn out more engineers that are specialised in this, for example? Uh, there's lots of work. I mean, other, and the ports, you know? Um, do ports need upgrading, for example? Uh, that's just a question. It's not a, a statement of fact. I'm just saying these, that, so you can start to see with all of that planning comes a lot of jobs just, just in preparing the way. Now, so I can't say to you today, uh, the first job will start, this first job will be in X date, but you can start to see that uh, just preparing the ground uh, for procurement processes, uh, you'll, you'll start to see a lot of, turning of of the machines if you like and just in construction alone like we can easily foresee 20 years worth of work for yeah. that region and, <laughs> and and that ain't nothing for the latrobe Tro valley and that part of gippsland yeah. um and then the maintenance spaces that you know that yeah, aren't constructed. all ongoing yeah all ongoing um i'm going to in a moment now throw to anna because anna's going to wrap us up a bit um anna is part of the friends of the earth and She's, she's a campaigner in the Act on Climate area. Um, so we're very excited to have Anna. But is there any final thoughts from Pat and Lily just before I bring Anna on? I mean, it's it's really hard to sum up because this, this policy is just so epic. We're, you know, we're really excited about it. Victoria is absolutely leading the country on this industry. So um, just, yeah, really excited to, to see more and, and, and well done, Minister. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pat. And... and Look, can I just thank uh, everyone, uh, people I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, the organisations uh, for, for, you know, um, keeping the faith on this and really working hard. Um, now, what, what I really want to say is that, you know, let's just all be ready. These are really exciting times. There's opportunities. I mean, we're, we're needing to engage with unions, uh, with union members, with so many local communities, with environmental organisations, uh, this is going to be a whole of a state, whole of state excitement. It's going to be certainly a revolution. Uh, and um, this is something that we're all going to be proud of because we will all have a role to play, a necessary role to play to make this happen, to get it actually happening. Our commitment is there um, and uh, it's going to be a massive game changer for the whole country. Yeah, well, thank you for your contributions, Pat and Minister Lily D'Ambrosio. Um, we are very proud of this announcement. It is a crowning achievement for any minister um, and will make substantial change, not just that to region, for all Victoria. Not many politicians get to say they've got to do this, but it's <laughs> taken your tireless um, activism and tireless advocating to make this happen. Um, and no one should be under any illusions of how much work this minister puts in to make change happen. So um, thank you and congratulations. And I'll bring on Anna. 
Thanks so much, Luke. Um, and thank you, Minister, for making the time to uh, share the details of this announcement with the community. Um, it's just so exciting. We, we haven't been able to stop saying how excited we are by it in the <laughs> office all week. Um, and I think one of the really powerful things about it is that the announcement is such a big win for both climate and jobs as what the conversation's really focused on. Um, so, you know, the um, minister that you spoke about um, ensuring that there's a rigorous consultation process to really um, get this done properly. Um, and I think, you know, that that's just exactly the kind of thing we need to hear because as we know, renewables, um, they're not automatically good for everyone. We know that if we net, if we let the tech billionaires chart the path to a transformed economy, we'll be dealing with, you know, disaster capitalism as well as climate disasters. So um, this announcement really shows that it's, it's really impressive forward planning by the state government to ensure the best outcomes for workers and communities. Um, because renewables do have to be good for local jobs, First Nations people, ecosystems and the climate. Um, and I think another thing to reflect on is what's so exciting is that it really does bring in the whole state, um, this pipeline of projects. Um, like we, we had Luke from the Bendigo Trades Hall ask about um, what the job opportunities might be for workers in communities away from the coast, like in central Victoria. Um, and I think, yeah, as you've talked about, that's what's really um, exciting about it is that it's not just workers at the ports and the coastal towns, like it will be involvement across the entire state, um, like a really big joint project. Um, so yeah, I think um, Pat and I and everyone at Friends of the Earth, we're just really, really psyched to be doing this work alongside the union movement um, to campaign for climate solutions that have social justice at their core. Um, Friends of the Earth's been around for nearly 50 years in Australia and um, we're really proud that we have a long history of working in solidarity with the union movement um, for shared outcomes for environmental and social justice. Um, and I will briefly mention that uh, one of our current projects is called the Climate Impacts at Work Project. Um, it's a research project we're undertaking with six Victorian unions to understand how workers are experiencing climate impacts in their workplaces. Um, so, you know, what does it look like for a train driver compared with a nurse or a hospo worker? Um, and a couple of us were in Ballarat last night with the crew at the Ballarat Trades Hall um, and Colin from the Vic Trades Hall uh, to hold a discussion about what climate looks like for workers in that region. Um, so yeah, that, that project, um, the surveys that are open as part of that will close off soon and we're, we're looking forward um, to briefing you and unions and the hall um, and releasing results later in the middle of the year. Um, and I suppose finally, uh, before I hand back to Luke, uh, we couldn't end a Friends of the Earth event without a, a bit of a fun call to action. Um, when it comes to tackling the climate crisis, we know that we're in a race to zero emissions. And uh, because we have a federal election coming up, um, finally, and we are all getting back on the ground for in real life actions, uh, I wanted to close by inviting all the participants on the call um, to a really awesome creative action we've got coming up. Um, on Saturday, March 19, at the Box Hill Athletics Club, we're going to be staging a choreographed aerial photo uh, where we'll mark out on the 100 metre race track where each federal party stands in the race to zero emissions. Um, we're at 73 RSVPs last I checked and I reckon there's totally enough people in here for us to bump it up to 100 by the end of the night. So uh, I'm going to chuck the link in the chat for anyone that wants to join us at that. And, What's the date uh, again, Anna? Sorry? What's the date of it again? Uh, Saturday, March 19. So, what time do you want people down at Box Hill? Oh, God. I'll have to check the page myself on that. I think it's about one o'clock. It's um, early Arvo, but I'll put... And the then we can in. head off for dumplings after, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we'll have to after standing out in the sun. Um, so I'll, uh, yeah, I'll pass it back to Luke to show everyone out the virtual door. Well, uh, comrades, sisters and brothers, thank you for being here for what I think was 
a terrific and very frank Q and A. Um, thank you, Minister. There was there was no um, there, there was there was no shirking those questions, and there was very direct <laughs> answers. I think we got we got through more questions here today in forty minutes than you'll ever get done in question time. True. So, <laughs> that was terrific. So thanks for being with us, Pat. Again, um, thanks for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom, and Anna for your energy and your next steps and what we need to do in the campaign, which I mainly heard campaign, which I mainly heard was go to Box Hill and eat some dumplings. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Minister.